Today we start our second in a three part series of CME sessions. And without further ado, I put you on to Dr. Thomas, who will be chairing today's session. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Good morning, everyone. Thanks again for joining us. So, to, as um, Mr. Bovell mentioned, this is the second in a series of lectures being hosted by the Medical Benefits Scheme. And just a bit of background for those that might be unfamiliar the, with the rising chronic illnesses that were seen back in the 70s, it was decided by the government uh, to enact or to formulate the Medical Benefits Scheme which seeks to provide a financial assistance as well as pharmaceutical supplies to residents of, the, of Antigua and Barbuda. So there are 11 illnesses that are, are covered by the scheme. Asthma, cancer, cardiovascular diseases, certified lunacy, diabetes, epilepsy, glaucoma, hypertension, leprosy, Parkinson's disease, and sickle cell anemia. Today, we'll be highlighting two of those illnesses, at least management of those illnesses. And we thought it important because of the recently new pharmaceutical tools have been made available to us. So these are experts in the field that will help us in deploying these new tools appropriately. Today, we will have our first speaker being Dr. Dwight Mathias, who's a consultant endocrinologist and internist. And our second speaker, Dr. Terry Baker, a consultant pulmonologist and internist. So first, I am going to introduce our speaker, Dr. Dwight Mathias. He practices both general endocrinology and internal medicine in Virginia, USA, and twice yearly has general endocrine clinics in Grenada. He was actually born in Grenada. After completing high school there, he emigrated to America where he received his BSc degree in biological sciences with emphasis in genetics from the State University of New York at Buffalo. He began graduate studies at New York University and, pardon me, sorry. He began graduate studies at NYU, New York University in biochemistry and worked in Dr. Blas Fragioni's lab as a research associate, sequencing the amyloid protein extracted from the brain of Alzheimer's patients. Dr. Mathias received a scholarship and completed his medical education at St. George's University. His internship and residency programs were at Albert Einstein College of Medicine the, at the Jacoby Medical Campus in New York City. He was the first graduate to complete the women's health track in internal medicine at that institution. Dr. Mathias was accepted at Stanford University to pursue a fellowship in endocrinology. He was mentored by Dr. Andrew Hoffman and his areas of focus were in pituitary diseases as well as testicular dysfunction. After completing his fellowship, he was an assistant professor of medicine in the Department of Medicine at Eastern Virginia Medical School and subsequently transitioned to private practice. Dr. Mathias has lectured extensively in both America as well as the Caribbean region on diabetes and its complications. He has published in peer reviewed journals. He presently is a member of the Endocrine Society and is a member of their finance and audit committee. He's also a member of the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, as well as the American Diabetes Association. He is a fellow of the American College of Physicians. Dr. Mathias is also a member of the board of directors of the St. George's University Alumni Association. He's married and has one son. 
He is proud of his Caribbean roots and his parents are from St. Vincent and Grenada with a grandfather from Martinique and his wife is from Barbados. So clearly Dr. Mathias is a true, true Caribbean man. So without further ado, I turn you over to Dr. Dwight Mathias. You could unmute your mic there, Dr. Mathias. Here we go. Dr. Thomas, I wish to thank you for your kind introduction. And, um, and for those uh, on the other end, uh, thanks for taking your Saturday off to be with us. Now, we have lots in store here to discuss. So first, uh, before I share my screen, there are a couple of questions that um, will be posted. And I greatly appreciate uh, every of the viewers uh, uh, respond to the questions. As the first question states, which of the following characteristics would be a major consideration in the selection of your preferred glucose lowering therapy? The second question is, which medication therapy would you most like to understand better? Please identify the most significant barrier in implementing therapy for your patient to achieve the glycemic controls. How often do you currently consider both fasting and plasma glucose and postprandial glucose when selecting an anti-hypoglycemic therapy. How often do you currently base your glucose lowering therapy on low blood sugars risk? Those are very important questions that we will reflect on on my presentation today. I am given the task to talk about pharmotherapy of the patient management in diabetic patients. It will be a very uh, uh, thorough presentation, lots of details to cover, and hopefully we'll have a robust discussion after this conversation. I will quickly go through the, um, the question and start my presentation here. The outline of my presentation Basically, as Dr. Thomas initially mentioned, the COVID ep epidemic here um, within um, our community, I will briefly talk about the long-term complication in youth transitioning into adult. Uh, it's a very important summary of an article that was uh, written at the, in New England Journal of Medicine in July of this year. We will transition to the, uh, to the natural history of diabetes and the pathophysiology overview the non-insulin anti-diabetic drugs and properties of those agents. And finally, we will look at the standard of medical care in diabetes. I recently received some data about the uh, uh, prescription uh, nature in Antigua, and hopefully we can put all that together and, and uh, appreciate this conversation. So first, COVID. COVID has... COVID has really had an effect on our area. When with COVID and in terms of diabetes, we know that it affects the beta cell and also has a systemic effect. With the beta cell specifically, there are receptors on the surfaces of, of, of um, 
the beta cell that COVID-19 um, uh, binds to. And as a result, it replicates itself, destroy insulin production through the mechanism of inflammation or increase its production within the beta cell. And as a result, we have the hyperglycemia, which is of a great magnitude. Many of these patients presents with abdominal discomfort, even pancreatitis, uh, destruction of beta cells. Uh, there's a term that has been um, 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 discussed in our circle that the COVID-19 also have a trans uh, differentiation of, of, of the beta cell. In, in other words, it produces glucagon or even increased trypsin-1 leading to the pancreatic uh, uh, pancreatitis. Also, in the treatment of COVID, we use high dose of steroids, and even the antiviral that is used contributing to um, impaired insulin sensitivity, thus leading to the hypoglycemia that we see today. In those patients, remember, those of you who are treating COVID-19 pa uh, infected patients, the requirement of insulin may have to go up due to the insulin resistance that we observe in those patients. And even in patients who are infected uh, with uh, COVID, the, um, the therapy may have to be adjusted because of the uh, uh, marked in increase in the hypoglycemia. But those who are not in, uh, infected with COVID, we are seeing because of the stress and the inactivity that occur, you may start seeing increase in the hypoglycemia thus leading to type two diabetes. So uh, a point here, COVID does have a profound effect on the beta cell and the treatment management of those with diabetes. We know because of high blood sugar, uh, one of the main concern is that uh, sugars, hypoglycemia, augment the process of vascular disease. It causes endothelial dysfunction and rigidity of the arteries. And from uh, observational studies, this estimated reduction in life expectancy in folks who are 65 and older with diabetes may have a six years reduction in life expectancy. And those with type 2 diabetes and myocardial infarction, you can see the downward trend. Thus, as clinicians, we have to look beyond the hypoglycemia, but look beyond the complication of cardiovascular disease in our patients. This was an article put forward uh, uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine in July of this year. It was 500 uh, youth diagnosed with diabetes transition into the adulthood, and they are followed for over 15 years. And basically, at the time of diagnosis, you can see how uh, adequately controlled these individuals was. And as time progressed through years, you can see the horrible job that was done, basically. Uh, A1C in less than 6.5 dropped from a 75 to 19 and also uh, the elevated sugars in the adulthood, re-emphasizing the point that diabetes is a progressive disease and our therapy regimen has to change along as the, uh, as the disease progress. They also look at some of the microvascular complication in these individuals. And in the early phase of the observation of these young kids into their adulthood, we can see that micro, uh, uh, microvascular complication at the kidney was greatly uh, uh, compared to, to neuropathy and retinopathy. And there were overlapping of the uh, microvascular complications. Further, even in the early phase of those diagnoses, there were already 61% of the patient already had one complications. So it's very important that we should be aggressive in monitoring our diabetic patients uh, for possible complications. Even, and this is the point that has to be reinforced here, even in the pre-diabetic phase, 10 to 15% of your patient may already have microvascular complications. So don't think that prediabetes is a naive uh, condition and just uh, recommend uh, lifestyle change. You have to be aggressive in those patients. So what is the underlying defect of, these, of this condition? Insulin resistance is a core defect of diabetes. And that's why it's most important as clinician, be aware of some of the clinical findings that you see in today's clinic. 
fat accumulation, the patient weight is increasing, blood sugars, a random blood sugar that may be elevated. There may be family history involved in, in this uh, 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 with diabetes, smoking, inactivity. Just be aware of some of the, um, the cause or that may lead to insulin resistance. And as you further investigate these patients, you can, for example, look at skin tags or acantosis nigricans, the increased pigmentation in the neck area. Does that young lady has a polycystic ovarian syndrome? As you um, screen the patient lipid profile, do they have high triglycerides or low HDL? And, and as I said before, blood pressure monitoring and the monitoring of blood glucose is very important to identify the core defect of uh, diabetes, the insulin resistance. This can be depicted based on the glucose level. Even in the early phase of prediabetes, you can start seeing the separation of the postprandial with the fasting glucose. Yes, you may do a fasting glucose, maybe a normal range, but in two hours after eating, you may have uh, elevated blood sugars. That's what you see in the pre-diabetic phase of the individual. And in the background, we have beta cell function that is uh, uh, magnified. And there'll come a point where the beta cells start uh, failing. And as a result of that, the progression occurs. So it's very important to understand why pre and postprandial blood glucose monitoring in a diabetic patient is most important to help you uh, improve the outcome because it is a reflection of beta cell function with the underlying defect of insulin resistance. And here to encompass uh, this whole uh, diabetes uh, pathology, we know, for example, that there is a decrease in cretin effect. That is to say the gut hormone production, and I will go further into this uh, in, in my presentation. The gut hormone production, the glucagon-like polypeptide levels may be decreased. Uh, there is decreased insulin production due to the beta cell failure. And as a result of that, we may have increased hepatic glucose for production from an increased glucagon secretion. And there is increased glucose reabsorption at the renal level. And there is also at the uh, uh, central level, we may have neurotransmitter dysfunction, which I'll discuss. So this ominous octet uh, theory was put forward by Dr. Blas Frangioni at Texas Houston Hospital. And this regimen itself is a good guide to help us in our know, management of type two diabetes. The insulin resistance at the peripheral tissue, that is the muscles and the fat cells, the decreased insulin production, the increased glucagon production, the decrease in cretin effect, that's a glut hormone, the neurotransmitters uh, 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 dysfunction and the lipolysis that occur at the fat tissue. So as we approach the pharmacologic approaches to treatment of diabetes, it is, and I have to reinforce that again, that is most important that we have exposure to the defect, insulin resistance, decreased glucose, uh, decreased uh, insulin production, increased glycogen secretion, peripheral resistance, increasing effect, and reabsorption of glucose uh, at the renal level. So here is a case I want to put forward to you. MK is a 66-year-old educated professional who has type 2 diabetes for several years. He's 5'10", 100 kilos, and he takes metformin twice daily, glipizide, 10 milligrams daily, actose, 30 milligrams daily. He refused to uh, begin insulin therapy, but uh, he was able to, to, to convince by his MD to start basal insulin glargy. He is frustrated. He said it doesn't work, so he stopped the insulin therapy. His A1C presently is 8.8%. The question to you, what would you do next? And hopefully through this discussion, you will get further ideas how to manage this patient. First line treatment and improvement of insulin resistance. That term comes back again, insulin resistance in the treatment of diabetes, weight management. Oftentimes as clinician, we do not reinforce this point of weight management because we know that weight loss have 
beneficial effect in our therapy. This is a study that was done at Jocelyn Institute in Boston. And basically, these patients were obese patients who were diabetic. And as you look at the percentage of weight loss in those individuals who went beyond 10 pounds weight loss, 10% uh, of their weight loss, we saw that there was a 14% remission of diabetes. There was a 21% of those patients had to stop insulin and a 50 to 60% reduction in medication. So in my clinic, my uh, first visit, one of my plan, 10% weight loss in pounds. And you will see the benefits of the weight loss in our regimen therapy. Uh, this is where the dietitian nutrition comes into play to empower your patients to deal with these benefits. The treatment guidelines outline that metformin should be the initial line of therapy accompanied with lifestyle modification. Lifestyle modification, increase physical activity, decrease carbohydrate intake, increase protein intake. And the main function of metformin is to reduce the hepatic glucose production and increase the peripheral absorption of glucose. In other words, increase peripheral sensitivity to insulin and to decrease glucose um, absorption at the gut level. And we know that the class of drugs, the biguanidine metformin, has high efficacy. The cost is low, the risk of hypoglycemia is low, there is neutral weight change, cardiovascular benefits is not confirmed, but there are some studies that show some potential there. Heart failure is neutral in those patients. But what is important in the metformin in, uh, patient is that as EGFR decrease, yes, EGFR at least 35, uh, uh, they can be on metformin. And oftentimes, patient who has been on metformin for over five years can develop some B12 deficiency. So I will recommend that this level be checked every so often. And I receive, uh, I will say, most, some of the most common side effects of, 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 of metformin is usually the GI symptoms. And from my clinical experience, what I have, what I have observed is that many uh, patients take the metformin without eating. And that caused the GI irritation. So reinforced timing and gradual titration of this drug. How does metformin work? Metformin, once it enters the cell, it binds to the AMP kinase. That in turn uh, um, activates the glucone receptor that into, uh, has an influx of uh, glucose intake and decrease gluconeogenesis. So its mechanism is via the AMP kinase within the beta cell. Another drug that we use often is the sulfonylureas, and we are quite familiar with that. We use most of the second generation. Why? The first generation sulfonylurea has increased incidence of hypoglycemia. And, and this drug uh, here in the United States, I think in Antigua, you may have the diabetes, et cetera, that you may use. But here in the States, we use the gliberide, the glipizide, and the glimepramide. If efficacy is very high, the cost is low, the risk of hypoglycemia is very high, especially in our elderly patients and those who may have some renal insufficiency. The cardiovascular benefits is neutral and the renal effect, as I alluded to early, that with um, uh, diabetic kidney disease, be cautious because of the risk of hypoglycemia. And in terms of cardiovascular effects, sulfonylurea binds the sulfonylurea receptor on beta cell, and you have a reflux of uh, uh, potassium, and that can cause a stunning um, after MI and thus lead to more complication in those patients. So it's very careful, uh, be very careful in using these drugs uh, on patients with MI. It's, it, the trend now within these United States, there is a downward there is a downward um, use uh, of, of these drugs because of the new um, guys on the block, the new treatment regimen. Now, we know that when we use sulfonylurea, you do have an initial drop of the A1C, but as time progresses, due to beta cell failure, you have a reuptake of the A1C. So the efficacy of sulfonylurea wean off in time. 
All right, because as I said earlier, diabetes is a progressive disease that needs aggressive therapy. Keep that in mind. The, the thiazolidines, Dione, short PZD, um, it's the only diabetic drug that goes after the core defect of diabetes, insulin resistance. Um, uh, pioglitazone and rosiglitazone, they have been in the forefront a couple of years ago because of the adverse event that occur. The studies were re um, 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 uh, committed, and uh, as a result, the drugs are back in the market. But because of the stain or because of the potential adverse event they had, they are less used today. Um, efficacy is very high. The cost is low. The risk of hypoglycemia is very low. Uh, weight chain, yes, there is an edema that occurs with uh, th this drug, uh, more with the rosy than the pio. The cardiovascular benefit with the pio is, 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 is uh, present, there is potential benefit there, and there is increased risk of heart failure with these drugs, as I said, due to edema. Um, there is, a, 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 with diabetes, uh, kidney disease progression, this drug has a neutral effect for that, and no dose adjustment is required. The FDA give a black box warning of congestive heart failure with these patients. In my clinic, what I do, once a patient is on those drugs, Whenever I see them every three or six months, I do the lower extremities examination for edema, or if there is a double, uh, 10 pounds, five pounds weight loss, I know it's time to um, either decrease the dose or stop the medication, et cetera. Its benefits is in NASH in terms of uh, um, non-alcoholic steatosis, hepatitis, and there is risk for bone fractures in these individuals. There are cases where the TZDs can cause bladder cancer, and there is an increased LDL um, with the rosiglitazone. Now, we know with this drug, it does has a, 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 a in combination therapy, there is a sustain of the A1C. When the TZDs is added to metformin or insulin, you will see that, that, that impressive drop of A1C and it's sustained with lifestyle change, et cetera, for a period of time. And once you stop those uh, TZDs, rosiglitazone or pioglitazone, you'll see an upward swing of the A1C of blood sugars. But it's a very effective drug in combination therapy. Uh, DPP-4 inhibitors. Uh, these drugs I will uh, discuss further later on. They are the drugs of citagliptin, saxagliptin, linagliptin, allogliptin. Um, basically, the, action, the mechanism of action is to prolong the, the lifespan of the GLP-1 glucagon-like polypeptide. Uh, uh, glucagon -like peptide. So these drugs, et cetera, their efficacy is intermediate. The cost is high. Risk of, of, of low blood sugars is nil. Cardiovascular benefits uh, have, uh, um, is neutral. Heart failure with a saxagliptin group. And um, the dose are adjusted based on renal function. The, most, uh, the one that is not adjusted is linagliptin in that uh, group. And the potential risk of pancreatitis and joint pain exists in um, uh, uh, this class of drugs. I would recommend that if there is a, a selection of this drug, the linagliptin, because it, in the diabetic population due to the renal complication that may occur, you can keep this drug on without worry about adjustment in uh, potential kidney. Uh, the glucagon-like uh, polypeptide receptor agonist, uh, the class of drugs itself, exadenatide, lambergatide, lexizenatide, dulaglutide, and semiglutide, these are all injectable drugs. And I, again, I will outline the mechanism of action. The efficacy is high in those drugs in low in A1C and improving blood sugars. They have this postprandial effect. Uh, post meal instead of having that surge, it, it mechanism of action uh, most likely inhibit glucagon uh, uh, production. And uh, uh, there are uh, benefits uh, in this class of drugs uh, in terms of uh, uh, decreasing cardiovascular events, heart failure um, um, complications uh, uh, neutral, the renal dose, diabetes, keto, uh, uh, kidney disease progression, 
uh, there is benefit with liraglutide, and uh, there is uh, there is uh, no uh, uh, adjustment of those except for the lexithenotide and the dieta. We uh, taper lower in these uh, patients. The black box side effect is the GI symptoms. It works centrally, basically decreasing the satiety, decrease decreasing um, uh, um, contractility of, of the stomach, thus having this sort of bloating sensation, and you may have some nausea and vomiting if patient overeat. Basically, I use it a great deal to control appetite in my patients. Uh, there is also some potential risk of um, of, of pancreatitis in those patients. We know, for example, that um, the, 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 the incretin pathway involves two um, um, agents, the glucagon-like polypeptide, as I alluded to earlier, and the DPP-4 inhibitors. As we ingest food and it enters the stomach, the glucose level, there is release of the gut hormones, the GLP-1 glucagon-like polypeptide, and it's, uh, and this in turn, the, the incretins, activate uh, inc insulin secretion in a glucose-dependent mar marker, thus, le thus leading to increased glucose uptake of the muscles, and a decrease in glucose release from the liver. And DPP-4 uh, uh, itself uh, inactivate uh, uh, these enzymes, and the DPP-4 inhibitors will block this, thus prolonging the half-life of G GLP-1. So this is basically how this uh, the incretin works. It's a glucose-dependent release of insulin uh, by the effect of these incretin hormones. And we know what happens with this GLP-1, that the diabetic patients who receive um, a, a, a GLP-1 therapy, you will see an increase in insulin sensitivity in those patients over time, and thus lowering of blood glucose. So the, uh, the, the, the diabetic patients, which we can see an in insulin secretion rate is very low, but with um, uh, the GLP-1, you see the increase in insulin secretion in those patients, thus improving the postprandial hyperglycemia. The sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors, uh, the class of drugs in this group are the tamagliflozone, the DAPA, the EMPA, and the ERTU. They are mediate, and these drugs basically has both cardiovascular benefits and lowering blood glucose benefits. And there are studies that show due to the mechanism of action, they also have lowering of blood pressure. Um, the cost of these drugs are high. Hypoglycemic events is no. Weight change, yes, you do get weight loss with these uh, uh, oral agents. And uh, the cardiovascular benefits, heart failure benefits in these individuals are impressive. Um, yes, there are renal uh, adjustments with these patients, usually as low as EGF of 22 in some of these patients. Recent studies have shown, even in the DAPA group and the TANA group, um, that you can even go as low as 30 in, in those patients with EGFR. The black box warning here is that the, the, the um, the CANA group, um, uh, there will increase risk of amputation in, those, in that specifically class of drugs. But um, overall, um, uh, the, the, the risk of infection is very high in those individuals because of the glucose urea that exists in this class of drugs. So the mechanism of action in normal physiology, as the as 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 glucose is freely filtered into the proximal tubules, the SGLT2 um, um, receptor usually causes reabsorption of the glucose. But with the advent of the SGLT2 inhibitors, this is blocked, and as a result, we have free flow of the um, the glucose into the urine. So the 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 uh, CANA and uh, DAPA. Uh, EMPA, uh, glitazone, they work by blocking these receptors here. So as a result, you have free flow of glucose into uh, 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 the urine. And this is basically showing here the normal physiology of SGLT2 uh, mechanism via the sodium potassium pump caused the reabsorption of glucose and um, as a result of blocking that mechanism, we have excretion of glucose in the urine. 
insulins. Everyone is quite familiar with insulin, but here in these United States, we have a, a formulary that is very extensive. We have insulins, the rapid insulins, uh, the Lispro, the Aspart, and uh, glulysine, and even inhaled insulin. And there are also faster active insulin. In other words, insulin is becoming like a designer uh, 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 product now to cater for individuals. We, uh, there were a recent study in the literature showing that long acting insulin for one week, and that will be, uh, um, uh, we'll get more information about that soon. Um, short acting insulin, intermediate acting insulin, which is quite uh, common throughout the Caribbean. We have those patients who have severe insulin resistance requiring over two, 300 units of insulin a day. We have the more concentrated insulin, the U500 regular insulin. We have the long acting insulin, the glogine, uh, the detema, the degludec insulins, and we have the pre-mixed insulin. Now, efficacy with insulin, we all know it's worth. Um, and the cost, it all depends. Um, the inhaled insulin, et cetera, um, it, 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 it's, it's very expensive, the inhaled insulin. And uh, analogs, some of the new analogs here, they are expensive. The humulin, uh, um, the short acting insulin and the intermediate is relatively uh, cheap. Um, oftentimes, patients can go to the Walmart uh, stores and don't need a prescription, and they can get that insulin. The cardiovascular benefits of this drug is neutral, heart failure. Yes, there's edema that occur with high dose of insulin, and the dose of insulin has to be adjusted depending on the, uh, the EGFR. The, as EGFR decreases, um, uh, the dose of insulin will have to decrease because there will be stacking of the insulin um, for that period of time, increasing the risk of low blood sugars. And there are some side uh, uh, um, uh, less utilized anti-hyperglycemic agents. Um, we have the metlitonides. These are uh, uh, short acting quick onset, quick disappearance. I love it in my elderly patient because the risk of hypoglycemia is very low. It belongs to the class of sulfonuria, but it's quick and disappear. And the cost can be exorbitant in those uh, uh, can, with those class of drugs. You guys uh, use a lot of this drug in Antigua, um, uh, alpha glucosidase inhibitors. Uh, so, and we have the bile acid sequestrants. They have both lower in glucose and lower cholesterol benefit. We have the dopamine 2 agonist, the bromocryptine. It works centrally by improving um, um, the sympathetic uh, dopaminergic effect on glucose lowering. And we have the pramiglutide. This has not been used. I remember early in my endocrine training, this was used instead of the... Um, the GLP-1 we have today. It's a very effective in postprandial lowering of blood sugars. And this is just to outline to you how the, the bromocryptine work. We know that in diabetic patients, there's a decrease in dopaminergic activity in the morning. And in turn, that in turn lead to high glucose output, the, um, the dawn phenomenon-like picture, increased insulin resistance, increased fatty acids that occur. But with the... Um, the dopamine agonist therapy, we have a reversal of that and improvement of glucose tolerance in those patients. So that can also be used in our patients. So here we have just review the respective classes of drugs. Uh, 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 it's, 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 it's a fast review. There are more details involved here, but for the sake of time and to move on, what are we trying to accomplish with this therapy? Our aim basically is to lower the A1C, and here you can see the lowering effect of those drugs, which can help us improve the hypoglycemic in those patients. And uh, the, the minimal effect with dopamine agonist to the impressive lowering of our A1C in individuals. Now, this is a busy slide. This is the new algorithm that has been put forward by the Diabetes Association. And what is remarkable here instead of being insulin-centric or glucose-centric in our management with diabetes, we have transitioned into a more disease state or the potential risk of these patients. 
is does that patient have a cardiovascular risk in terms of heart failure, in terms of cardiovascular disease, in terms of renal disease, there's a selection of drugs. Are you concerned about hypoglycemia in your patients? There is an algorithm to follow. Are you concerned about the weight of your patient, uh, obese, et cetera? Uh, cost is a factor, the algorithm. So they have focused or transitioned from just being glucocentric, but looking at the disease state and the environment of back of diabetes. So we will take some time and look at uh, uh, each of these. In terms of uh, kin patients with indication of high risk of established cardiovascular disease and chronic disease and heart failure, remember in our patient population, uh, uh, lifestyle change is very important. And subsequently, you will add metformin. If there is contraindication, you will stop it. Then the, if the patient is not at goal, you will transition to either or. For example, established cardiovascular disease, high risk. Is the patient over uh, 55? Does the patient have coronary artery disease, uh, uh, carotid artery disease, or lower extremities peripheral vascular disease? Uh, is EGFR uh, um, and decrease in these patients? You will start a GLP-1, a glucagon-like polypeptide, because it has shown to have cardiovascular benefit in those patients. Or you may select an SGLT2 because it has shown to have cardiovascular. There's no doubt about these drugs and the benefits in terms of cardiovascular. If you're not at goal, you do a switch. So if, for example, you start a GLP-1 and you are not at goal, the next drug is to add an SGLT2 inhibitor uh, with, with those patients. And we know, for example, as the patient, as I said earlier, is a progressive disease, you may add other agents if you're not at goal. So again, with cardiovascular disease, a risk involved, you should focus on the benefits of, of improving um, their outcomes using these drugs. In terms of heart failure, there is impressive data today with the empagliflozin and, um, and the dapagliflozin showing improvement in heart failure in those patients in the mechanism of this. Uh, mechanism of action. So the SGLT2 with proven benefit in this population, and, uh, and this is being promoted a great deal here in these United States. Um, and with chronic kidney disease, again, uh, both uh, um, uh, uh, glyphosin and uh, empagliflozin have shown some um, renal benefits, uh, and uh, they are encouraged uh, to be used in patients with EGFR, if you look at the most recent data, as low as 30 um, ml per minute. And, it, and, and you will titrate accordingly depending on the achievement of the A1C that you have set for that patient. So if the limiting factor is the risk of hypoglycemia, uh, the patient is already lifestyle change, metformin, now you have to do a selection and you're very much concerned about the risk of, of, of low blood sugars. If the patient is above target, then you will add the agents, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors or the TZD to uh, achieve your goal. And the algorithm will say, for example, to um, add other agents. But if you are not at goal, obviously with, you may have to add an insulin and titrate uh, slowly with these patients. Uh, again, it, 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 you start off with D, DPP-4 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists or SGLT-2, and it's an interchange. You may have four agents to help with these patients, but the sulfur urea is a big no to patients who have high risk of, of, of hypoglycemia. And uh, choosing uh, uh, therapy for weight loss. We know that obesity, uh, overweight is a major problem in the diabetic population. And if that is of concern to you, you should initiate a beginner therapy in those patients that will benefit them. And we see the weight loss, particularly in the glucagon-like po uh, polypeptide receptor agonist therapy and with the um, 
uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors. So you can start with either. And as a result, if you're not at goal, you will have, you will have dual therapy. And subsequently, if you're still not at goal, you may end up selecting basal TZD or SGU caution with TZD because of the edema that may occur in those patients. And weight loss, um, 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 the hierarchy, the semiglutide, laryngotide, uh, et cetera. Well, I, let me give you a little feedback here. This came on the market, um, I think about three months ago or two months ago, uh, the new um, indication for weight loss and the, and, the, and, and the factory that makes the drug run out. So they're a backlog uh, of this drug because of the benefits you are seeing in terms of weight loss in, in those patients uh, using semiglutinide once a week drug. So many of these drugs are once a week now. It's given uh, and the weight loss benefit plus the cardiovascular benefits and the glucose lowering benefits of these patients are tremendous. And cost. Cost is always an issue with those policymakers in making available uh, our drugs. And as you can see here, uh, the, the reasonable cost drug, the soft urea, uh, if you're not at gold, you add a TZD, then you go to the respective uh, insulin um, uh, uh, agent that is most cost effective. So the algorithm shows the cost, uh, 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 a cost algorithm because of uh, the, the expensive nature of the other drugs itself. But then you're not getting the cardiovascular benefits or the renal production. You have to start thinking long-term uh, in terms of, uh, of the complication of diabetes because the objective is to prevent that from happening. And insulin um, um, therapy, intensified insulin. And, 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 and this is where you have exhausted your oral agent and you're still not at goal. You have to institute a basal insulin initially. And uh, at the initiation is usually uh, start at 10 units a day or 0.1 or 0.2 units a day in those patients. But, but I think it's very generous here, but you have to really think about the weight of these individuals uh, in terms of a 200, um, uh, greater than 200 pounds, 10 units a day is not going to help lower blood sugars, like our guy that we saw, he start 10 units, and he said, this is not working because of the background of insulin resistance in those patients. So you set a target with individuals, the goal that you would like to achieve, and you have to titrate insulin. Not every three months, probably every week or every three days, you may have to titrate up so that you can get to go. And if adding the basal insulin, you're not at goal, you now have to transition to mealtime insulin. Now, this is the recommendation by the different group, the American Diabetes Association and the European group, start basal insulin low dose, 0.1 to 0.2 units per kilogram per day, uh, the larger dose for patients who have severe hypoglycemia, 0.3 to 0.4 units, kilograms per day. The ACE guidelines use basically um, uh, eight percent uh, as a cutoff in the A1C. You start at uh, if you're less than eight uh, percent A1C, you start at 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. And if the A1C is greater than eight percent, you start basal insulin at 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 per kilogram. And, and, and uh, you start first at uh, so the patient is on max dose of uh, basal insulin. Can I just step aside and say, when you reach 50 units of basal insulin, please consider that adding a prandial insulin, not just increase basal, basal, basal. Use 50 uh, units of uh, basal insulin that you use and then consider adding prandial. And the prandial will be started with the first, uh, with the biggest meal, and then you will titrate from that and add to a second meal if warranted. Now, uh, many of the patients I see today uh, basically comes in on insulin, and then in turn, I will add a GLP-1 or SGLC-2 to give them that benefit of these drugs, and you will see the insulin dose decrease in those patients. If you're going to add uh, SGLT-2 or a, a glucagon-like polypeptide 
to the, your patients who are already on a soft urea on insulin, the dose of soft urea and insulin may have to decrease. You are, because you will have increased incidence of, of hypoglycemia in those patients. So back to our patient, Mr. K, he on maximum dose of metformin. He's on maximum dose of the extended release of glipizide. And he's on actose. He started insulin. It didn't work. His A1C is 8.8. I'm sure during this brief discussion, you have got a, uh, information to help you manage this patient and you look at him differently in terms of things to look at. Look at the duration of his diabetes. As I alluded to earlier in the study, diabetes is a progressive disease. Where is this individual on the spectrum of his disease state? Does he already have small vessel disease? Question two, look at his weight. His weight comes into uh, concern here. Look at the drugs we are treating him uh, in terms of uh, cardiovascular benefits, in terms of renal benefits in this patient. If we are going to start this patient on insulin, are we going to start him at 0.1 unit per kilogram or start at 0.4 units per kilogram? Is his A1C at goal? So those are questions that you have to answer as a patient clinician in managing this patient. On this evening. So how are we doing, I include we in this, how are we doing in terms of dispensing medication here? This is looking at the government pharmacy with an Antigua and Barbuda. And this is a trend that is observed from just capturing some data in the prescription or the filling, let's say the filling of the prescriptions of the island. As you can see here, the oral agents, alpha glucosidase, many of you may have experience with that, but softening urea is high on the spectrum. Metformin, DPP-4s, and insulin. So looking at this, I will say basically that formula is based on cost. We are not looking at some of the long-term complications. What is the incidence of amputation? What's the incidence of, 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 of kidney failure? What's the incidence of heart disease? I think if that data correlates with the management of diabetes, we will see a different dispense here. On the other end of insulin um, uh, dispense, we can see that there is a transition of, 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 of patients into the progressive nature of the diabetes spectrum, the use of insulin. Now, uh, uh, the basal insulin, the short-acting insulin, uh, I, I will assume those are the Lispro, et cetera, that we are seeing there, and the regular insulin, which is preferable. Here again, we see it's a cost issue. So, there are work to be done within our community to prevent the complications of diabetes. Selection of our, 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 our formulary drugs have to be reevaluated based on our objectives. In the outpatient setting, we need to have exposure for all the agents based on um, um, our patient population and what we are experiencing today. Saying all this, Insulin resistance is the core problem in overweight and obese patients. That should be our number one prescription, 10% of the weight loss in pounds. Two, reduction of body weight, clearing uh, that is to say the fat effect on insulin resistance to prevent diabetes. It can. Patient, uh, I always say, once I start insulin, I cannot get off insulin. But if you reinforce the point, 10% of your weight loss, you will see the improvement, or even as I showed earlier in the Jocelyn group, there were improvement in the diabetes. Remission of type two diabetes is possible through significant weight reduction. And diabetes treatment is individualized. I have to reinforce that we cannot use the same regimen for all diabetic patients. 
And that's the paradigm shift we have to work on in our population. Because we, the patient in front of us have different presentation and we should use the tools to help with that. In cretins, that's the glucagon-like polypeptide and the SGLT2 inhibitors are essential in managing type two diabetic patients. And in the COVID era we are in, are we seeing a new type, a new kind? Or is it just basically hastening the diagnosis of diabetes? We know we have steroid-induced diabetes. We know that we have uh, uh, inflammatory response to diabetes. But with our COVID, um, um, uh, the mechanisms of action and what we are learning about that, is there a new uh, diabetes? So I would like to thank my wife for giving me the time today because today is usually the honey to do list and she allotted me this time. I want to thank the folks who helped me. There were two folks who helped me with this slides, uh, Stephen Best from Barbados and um, uh, the Nova Nordis rep who gave me the non-branded slides. I wish to extend thanks to them and to the, to the team who invited me for this presentation today. I know it was not exhausted. There are more detail and hopefully in the future, I can zoom in and give more pertinent clinical data on the respective point. So saying all that, I would like to turn back the screen to the moderator. Great, great, great. Thank you so much. Okay, sorry about the feedback. Right. So, um, I found it quite interesting, you know, this, this new approach. Um, as you rightly pointed out, traditionally we've been, um, you know, glucocentric, so to speak, focusing mainly on just getting the getting the the blood sugar down and not looking at the the total picture, or, um, highlighting the complications and the potential risks of of lowering the glucose. So that that, that really is, as you say, a, quite a paradigm shift. No pyoglitazone as well and uh, rosy glitazone, which were, 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 were dirty words um, for diabetes, diabetes management. And I also found it interesting that they seem to be making a comeback. So yeah, you, there, there were follow-up studies. There were follow-up studies to the critique of that. Could you, and your uh, mic is muted, Doc, so I didn't hear you. My mic is muted. No, maybe. There were follow-up studies that uh, clarify some of the data from the Accord study, thus um, showing the benefits of the pyoglitazone particularly. Great. There was a point in the presentation where you know we weren't hearing the audio. Um, I think it was just briefly, just one or two spots. Um, with re with respect to the sulfonylureas, you had mentioned, I think you were showing some data that they're pretty effective at lowering the A1C fairly promptly, but it seems to have been a, that, that, that wasn't sustained, this drop in A1C, whereas apparently some of the other classes, for example, the um, TZD seem to do a much better job of, of um, holding, holding that. And we do, as you, you probably realize, still use a lot of, um, you know, sulfonylureas in our, in our patients. Yes, uh, with sulfonylureas, remember, uh, at the time of diagnosis of diabetes, you already lost 50% of your basal cell function, right, or even before. So here we have a sulfonylurea that are going to um, bind the receptors on the beta cells and say, come on, work harder, you know? So initially it's gonna increase insulin production, but there is a limit. And that's why after a period of time, as you have decrease in beta cell functionality, you will see a decline and the patient will have to transition to insulin. And that's why you have the upsurge. 
in those patients. Okay, great. Anyway, I think I've, I've um, chimed in enough for now. There's some questions that the audience posed. Um, let me see if I could just take a quick look through. Hmm. Having trouble scrolling. Okay, no, I'm not really seeing any questions here. Can you? No, I, I, I just, uh, let me see if I have, I have access here. Either I did an excellent job or they're all sleeping having their coffee. <laughs> Let's see here, I'm not seeing, yeah. But, you know, um, uh, if, 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 the, if the question that was posed earlier um, in regards to uh, the objective way of looking at patients you are treating with diabetes, you have to look at the preprandial, postprandial picture, and the, is the regimen I'm working on is it going to help improve that A1C, the risk of low blood sugars, and you got to have a robust formulary to, to improve because the idea is that if diabetes is not adequately controlled within our Caribbean population, look at the dialysis issue we are having. Look at the amputation issue we are having in our neighbor islands. Uh, look at the problem with vision. The productivity of our population will not be as what it was in the younger side. So it's very important for us to, to have a different uh, perspective in managing our diabetic patients. As you have said earlier, rather than focusing on the hyperglycemia. Great. There's a question coming from the audience, um, from one of our um, panelists actually. What is your take on self-monitoring, self-testing? Oh, I'm that for 100%. Uh, the, the idea is this, that um, you have to know what you're treating. And uh, if, you, if the patient appears in front of you and is, are you, what are you gonna, without numbers or without any data points, you are getting an A1C every three months or every six months. And that's what you're using to, to determine. But should you increase the metformin or should you add another agent? Where, what's the trend you're looking at? You have to look at trends and determine the intervention. Uh, I am fortunate enough to be in an environment where I have the continuous glucose monitoring device. And to be truthful about that, many of the patients make lifestyle changes on their own because they are learning that with certain activity or certain foods, there is a marked difference in the blood sugars. So for example, you may say, Doc, I'm eating healthy. I'm eating a lot of fruits, I'm working out. And basically you will use those continuous glucose monitoring and you will see the effect the fruits are having on the blood sugars. Or the patient may be taking a, a mixed insulin and they are complaining, I'm having headaches, I cannot sleep, I'm having nightmares. And you'll be surprised that the continuous glucose monitoring device will pick up those incidents of low blood sugars while the patient is sleeping. So you can make adjustments in the regimen. So this is a gift to we endocrinologists, or those of us who are taking care of um, diabetic patients, getting access to the continuous glucose monitoring device is tremendous. And yes, we have devices today that, 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 that can help us in that route. Patients should be monitored. All diabetic patients should have a monitor, self-monitor, not only in the morning. They should be doing it throughout the day, breakfast, lunch, or even at bedtime. I'm not saying monitor four times a day. If you have to monitor once a day, move it around. Today, breakfast, tomorrow, lunch, the next day, dinner, then bedtime. So you will have all that data and you will infer on the follow-up visit. Excellent, Doc. So, I mean, I, as you said, I think we can go on and on. There's so many questions, you know, that, that we have that, you know, we, that need answering. So perhaps, you know, we can um, invite you back again to, to, to give some more details on this very, very important, very, very important subject. So thanks once again. It's been a you know really wonderful presentation, and um, you know we we hope to to invite you back again in the near future.
All right, again, thanks for the invitation and it's always a pleasure. Um, I should say to you, about, uh, I was in Antigua and Anti uh, uh, in June and with my family and we had a fun time and hopefully see you guys again. Bye-bye. Okay, bye, bye. Thank you so much, Doc. So now we are going to move on to our second speaker for this morning. And it gives us great pleasure to introduce Dr. Terry Baker, who is an internist and a, and a pulmonologist, having completed undergraduate studies and postgraduate studies at the University of the West Indies, Mona. She did her clinical fellowship in pulmonology at the University of Toronto in Canada. Dr. Baker is currently the senior medical officer of the National Chest Hospital in Jamaica, where she leads a team of medical and paramedical staff. She has responsibility for inpatient as well as outpatient medical care, service delivery, budgets, and program implementation. Dr. Baker is an associate lecturer in the Department of Medicine at the University Hospital of the West Indies and is an examiner of undergraduate and postgraduate candidates in medicine. Dr. Baker works both in the public health sector as well as in private practice as an internist and pulmonologist. She's a member of several professional bodies, including the Association of Consultant Physicians, Jamaica, the European Respiratory Society, and an affiliate member of the American College of chest physicians. Her duties extend beyond hospital administration and public and public private consultation because Dr. Baker is actively involved in research and educational programs for varying groups of health professionals as well as the public with an interest in asthma, COPD, tuberculosis, lung cancer, as well as anti-smoking advocacy. She has presented extensively throughout Jamaica and overseas in the Caribbean and the USA. Dr. Baker is motivated, driven, and actively seeks to expand horizons while ensuring equity and quality healthcare. Dr. Baker, thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Thomas, and let me just say thank you to all of you for logging in on this Saturday morning. Good morning, Antigua, and thank you to Dr. Cordner for inviting me. I am going to be looking at the updates as it pertains to GINA 2021 and how this may impact asthma care moving forward. So I'm going to share my screen. I hope Great. Um, okay. So we're going to, as I said, we're going to be looking at the, the GINA 2021 updates in the management of asthma and how we may apply this in practice if, if relevant. So as for the outline of the presentation, looking at asthma and GINA, we're looking at certain aspects of the updates, the more relevant aspects or, and with this, it would include what is the revised definition of severe asthma and its clinical significance. We'll be looking at personalized treatment and pharmacological treatment updates. And of course, in 2021, what we have to include COVID-19 pandemic and how this may impact our patients' health, including our patients with asthma. So this is not new to us. You know, we know that asthma is the most common chronic non-communicable disease. In 2019, it was estimated that over six, 260 million people 
were affected, and this is, I dare say, an underrepresentation or an underestimate of the true numbers. So, what happens during asthma? Keywords here is that it is variable. It is respiratory symptoms. So unlike some other respiratory conditions that we have, really and truly other organ systems are not affected. And these symptoms that we see with asthma include wheeze, shortness of breath, chest tightness, and cough with a variable expiratory airflow limitation. And I will remind us all that someone with asthma need not have all of the above symptoms. People with asthma will have periods of worsening symptoms and worsening airflow obstruction, and we call these exacerbations. And still in 2021, in spite of all the inroads that we have made, an acute exacerbation of asthma may still be fatal. Most of the morbidity and mortality associated with asthma is preventable, particularly with the use of inhaled corticosteroids and GINA 2021 has recognized this by incorporating it in its asthma updates. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry for the back. No, Hello? Me, so, so sorry to interrupt. We're still seeing that first um, screen. I'm not sorry. sure, first slide. I'm not sure if you had intended to move on already. On my screen, it, screen, it has moved on. Um, let me see, are you still seeing, let me, let me go back. So you're seeing the Gina 2021, the, the, the title. first slide? Yes, yes. Are you now seeing the second slide? No, not yet. Should I stop share and reload again? Yeah. Yes, let's, let's try that. Okay. Sorry about all of that. Let us try this again. All right, share screen. Let me go to this one and see. And Dr. Baker, you could put it in slideshow as well. All right, it's in slides show now, right? Hold a second for me. All right, so it's in slide show. And let us see, just let me know if this is working. So this is a title slide. Are you now seeing the second slide with the outline? No, still the, um, the title. Apparently you have to okay. click enable editing. Okay, let me go back. Sorry about all of this. Okay, then go to slideshow again. Okay. Are you seeing the second slide now? Yes, no, we can. Outline? Yes, no, we can. Okay, great. All right, sorry. Sorry about that. So just to recap, for the we're looking really at the GINA 2021 updates and how this we may incorporate it if we think it necessary into the management of our patients with asthma. So I'll be looking at asthma and Gina. I'll be looking at what Gina 2021 says about severe asthma, as well as personalized treatment and pharmacological treatment. And as I said before, this is COVID-19 pandemic, which has impacted every single aspect of our lives and no doubt the health of our patients, including those with asthma. So, yes, we know that asthma is very common, the most common chronic non-communicable disease with an estimated number of 260 million persons in 2019, which, as I said, I would dare say is an underestimate of the true numbers. And the symptoms associated with asthma include wheeze, shortness of breath, chest tightness, and cough with a variable expiratory airflow limitation. And it is associated with airway inflammation. Unlike other respiratory diseases such as COPD, asthma is truly a disease affecting the airways and not affecting other organ systems. 
people with asthma may not have all of the symptoms I just mentioned, because no one reads the textbook and may only present, say, for example, with shortness of breath and or cough. We do have periods of persons with asthma may have periods of acute worsening and worsening of symptoms and shortness of breath and their airway obstruction. And despite all of the advances we have made with regards to asthma management, it, asthma exacerbations may still be fatal. Most of the morbidity and mortality is preventable, particularly with the use of inhaled corticosteroids. And Gina has recognized this and made a stronger point for including inhaled corticosteroids in the management of persons with asthma. So what is Gina? I'm talking about Gina as if Gina is a person, but Gina, which stands for, the, which really means a global initiative for asthma, but worldwide is just called Gina, is an independent organization. It does not take, um, accept, donations from groups, but it is funded solely by the sale and licensing of its reports and figures. It was established in 1993, and the whole purpose of GINA is to increase awareness about asthma and to improve asthma prevention and management through coordinated global efforts. It uses an evidence-based strategy and therefore it is continuously reviewing various articles and studies as they come out and its recommendation is updated annually. And the recommendations are then adapted for local use or have been incorporated in other local guidelines. So Gina is a well-known body and a well-respected body that many other Organization, organizations use their recommendations as a platform or as a base for their, their guidelines going forward. And because it is a globally accepted organization and its recommendations are also globally accepted, it sort of levels the playing field when we can speak from one country to a next, one institution to a next and make reference to the GINA guidelines. So the GINA 2021 update, the main changes that we're seeing is a clarification on the definition of severe asthma. They have revised the management and treatment for adults and children, and they have updated their advice for managing asthma during the COVID-19 pandemic. So with regards to the definition of severe asthma. What does GINA 2021 say? GINA 2021 has tried to, to simplify or clarify the definition of severe asthma to avoid confusion. And it has said, it has defined severe asthma as now being asthma that is uncontrolled. So it is not just about the amount of medication the person is on, but it is uncontrolled despite using high dose inhaled corticosteroid, long acting beta agonist um, combinations or asthma that requires this combination to remain controlled. So the whole aspect of control is very important. And when we speak about uncontrolled asthma, we're making reference to either poor symptoms, someone who is having frequent symptoms despite being uh, um, adhering to medication. They have had exacerbations requiring two or more bursts of systemic corticosteroids, more than three days each, or they have had at least one hospitalization in the previous year, whether it be on the wards, ICU, or requiring mechanical ventilation and airflow limitation is still less than the lower limit of normal on spirometry, less than half the lower limit of normal. Or controlled asthma that requires high dose inhaled corticosteroids, systemic, co inhaled co systemic sorry, corticosteroids or other biologics 
for its control. So any one of the following would put a patient in the category of having uncontrolled asthma. But in saying this, we need to be clear that persons are adhering to treatment protocols before we can say persons are truly uncontrolled. So what are the consequences of severe asthma? Why are we taking such an interest? Because really and truly, the number of persons with severe uncontrolled asthma is quite small. But despite this, the mortality is high. The expenditure in terms of cost for the healthcare budget for many countries is high and also individual cost to patients or caregivers. And more than 500,000 hospitalizations each year in Europe is attributed to persons with severe asthma. So thus the burden of uncontrolled asthma is that it has an eight time higher risk of death that is severe uncontrolled asthma than compared to severe asthma by itself. So Gina has said, listen, this is what severe asthma is, but we need to pay attention to whether or not persons are controlled or uncontrolled, which will then guide management. And many of these persons, if not all, should actually be referred to a respiratory specialist or someone who is experienced in managing patients who have severe uncontrolled asthma. And that is it in a nutshell. And we're good because the other two areas, really, we have quite a bit of information to cover. Looking at management and treatment update, what has Gina said for 2021? Gina is emphasizing personalized asthma treatment. It has used the infographics, which they have placed as far back as 2016, 2017 guidelines, but now they are they have expanded it and they are speaking that really and truly the management of a patient with asthma should, in, should include continuous assessment, adjustment as needed and review. So this is not just a matter of writing a script and giving it to a patient, which unfortunately we still see coming out of some institutions and some emergency rooms and of, and and private offices. So it is not just a one size fits all. We should confirm the diagnosis if necessary. We should look at what symptoms the person has and what modifiable risk factors that we can address. So it's not just a case, oh, you have asthma, take this, but it really is personalized. What comorbidities coexist in this patient that we now say has asthma and those comorbidities themselves need to be looked at. We need to pay attention to inhaler technique and adherence. And for my patients, I said, with all due respect, whether you've had asthma for two years or 200 years, please walk with your device because we have quite a lot of different inhaler devices out there. So we need to go over. I need to see how you use your device and ensure that they are using it properly and that they are adhering to the recommendations. As health professionals as well, we need to educate or to be educated on the various devices and how they are used. Because I dare say quite a large percentage of us do not know how to use the inhaler devices correctly. And this has been borne out through um, studies that have actually looked at this. And unfortunately, it is the physicians that actually fall short compared to other health professionals involved in the management of patients with asthma. We need to look at the patient and parent preferences and goals. Right, so it's not just a case of take this, but if we're truly looking at adherence and compliance, it needs to be a partnership with our patients and with the caregivers and parents moving forward. We need to look at treatment, as I said, of the modifiable risk factors. So it's not just of the airway disease, 
non-pharmacological strategies. I will say to my patients, we're doing a virtual walkthrough. I will advise them in terms of perfume, um, detergent to use, cleansing agents to use in their house. So it's not just a matter of using inhalers. And we need to be comfortable in terms of adjustment and empowering our patients to know when to step up or step down. So it is ongoing education, skills training, and it really does take time if we are to really go through with our patients who have asthma. Patients need to be reviewed and we need to recognize that is not just a case of, oh, come back and see me in two months, come back and see me in three months, come back and see me in six months. So a lot of it depends on how controlled is this patient? Is this patient pregnant or not? Because if pregnant and even if controlled, we may want to see this patient more frequently. Has a person had a recent admission to hospital? Have they had a recent exacerbation? Is this person someone who we have identified that stress may be a factor and they have an upcoming um, exam or stressful event? So we need to get to know our patients and really have that partnership going on. So we look at symptoms, side effects, and how satisfied is the patient and the parent with regards to treatment choice and how they are functioning. So we assess, adjust, and review. We need to confirm the diagnosis. We need to identify risk factors. We need to ensure that this is not about us, and this is not about what pharmaceutical companies are saying. This is not about just the agents, but really ensure that the patient's preferences and goals are considered. No patient should feel pressured into using any one device or the next. We have so many devices and so many options out there that really and truly we need to take into consideration how our patients are feeling. And this continuous cycle of assess, adjust and review ensures that treatment is adjusted as needed and that we are reviewing our patients in a timely manner to ensure that there is control and effect change if needed. So the pharmacological treatment, and this is where Gina really has taken a bold step. In 2019, Gina made a fundamental change, fundamental change to his recommendations. And remember we said Gina has been around from 1993 and internationally is an accepted um, body that persons refer to and other organizations refer to for advice. But in 2019, Gina made a fundamental change in that it no longer recommended just the regular use of short acting beta agonists such as salbutamol or albuterol for persons diagnosed with asthma. That all persons, regardless of what step, regardless of severity, should be prescribed inhaled corticosteroids either to be used regularly or even during um, relief of symptoms, the need for relief of respiratory symptoms. So here it is, we have the whole world basically using short acting beta agonists for the acute exacerbation. And Gina is saying, hey, step back here. Everybody should be on an inhaled corticosteroid, whether it is as a preventer or whether we're using it as part of a reliever. The landmark changes no longer recommends the short acting beta agonist even for step one in adults and adolescents. And this did not come lightly. It came, the decision was based on evidence and there are numerous studies that have been put forward showing that short acting beta agonist only treatment increases the risk of severe exacerbations. And we could have a whole long talk looking at why this is so. And that adding any inhaled corticosteroid significantly reduces the risk. So all adults and adolescents should have ICS containing controller treatment to reduce the risk 
and it can be delivered by daily treatment or if the person has mild asthma by an as needed low dose ICS for motoral combination. No doubt, you know, the industry was up in arms as well as individuals as it now looked as if Gina was favoring one, one track in terms of managing our patients with asthma rather than others. And this strategy did not come lightly. They did look at various populations and looked at preventive strategy or strategies that other groups use, right? And what they're trying to really do is to reduce the probability of having a serious adverse outcome. So when we look at mild asthma, because now we're telling persons say, hey, it's not just the, only the salbutamol, but we, you really should be taking something else. And people are like, but I only have an attack once per year, twice per year, you know? So patients with what is thought to be mild asthma, based on the studies that date back as far as 2007 and even earlier, these persons are still at risk of having a serious adverse advent, advent, event. And they have looked at that 30 to 37% of adults who present with an acute exacerbation, thought to have had mild, mild symptoms, really had symptoms less than we had symptoms less than weekly in, pre in the previous three months. Right? And exacerbations we know are unpredictable. You step somewhere, you don't know when you're, you're going to be exposed to, to smoke, to fire, to, to various viruses, to pollens, to changes in temperature. You know, just yesterday, I, there is a colleague at work and she had an exacerbation because of the hand sanitizer that was used. And I mean, we know that hand sanitizers are all over. So we just don't know what may trigger someone, even someone who has mild asthma. Inhaled short acting beta agonist has been recommended as first line treatment for over 50 years. And because of this, people just grab for the salbutamol, grab for the salbutamol, when really and truly this over usage of salbutamol in many persons, and because they get the instant relief, may actually be pointing to uncontrolled asthma. And we did mention the risks associated with uncontrolled asthma earlier. So regular use, and I've had patients who say, I just used it for this week and I'm fine, is associated with adverse events. And even at a cellular level, what we're seeing is beta cell receptor down regulation decreased bronchial protection and decreased bronchodilator response. Higher use of these short acting beta agonists is associated with adverse clinical outcomes. And in reading, I found this quite enlightening because dispensing more than three canisters per year is associated with higher risk of severe exacerbations. And for those of us who take care of patients with asthma, three canisters per year of their short acting beta agonist was thought to be nothing. But now Gina is saying, wait, hold on a minute. Based on studies that these persons who are using more than three canisters per year of their reliever medication, this is associated with a higher risk of having severe exacerbation and an adverse clinical outcome. It has been shown that the inhaled corticosteroids do reduce the risk of asthma deaths, hospitalization, and exacerbations, particularly the usage of oral corticosteroids, but they also recognize that adherence is poor. Hence the recommendation of using a combination of an inhaled corticosteroid and fomoterol. So this was coming in GINA 2019 and GINA 2020. GINA 2021 realized this was causing quite a bit of uproar, quite a bit of confusion in the medical fraternity. And now what GINA 2021 has are two tracks, two tracks. Track one is a track which is a preferred track with the use of low dose 
inhaled corticosteroid for motorol as a reliever. And this will, it has been shown to reduce the risk of exacerbations compared with using a short acting beta agonist reliever alone. Track two, which is the alternative approach, does use a short acting beta agonist as a reliever and is recommended if track one is not possible. And remember, we're talking about personalizing treatment. So if track one is also not preferred by a patient who is not having exacerbations with their current controller therapy. Before we using, before using this regimen, which has a separate short acting beta agonist reliever, we need to assess whether or not this patient is likely to be adherent with a daily controller. Because if not, they're going to be exposed to the risk of using only the short acting beta agonist. And as we have pointed out before, this is associated with an increased risk of having adverse outcomes. We still have the step up, step down as before, and we're not going to all of this. This is just to look at what the different tracks are. So the, the, the diagram at the top looks at, and this is for adults and adolescents, 12 plus years. Steps one and two now have the as needed low dose ICS for motoral combination. And for all steps, the reliever should be the as needed low dose ICS for motoral. Prior to 2019, Step one would be the as needed short acting beta agonist. And step two would have the use of the low dose inhaled corticosteroid plus the short acting beta agonist. So right now, track one is saying, listen, for all steps, the reliever should be the low dose ICS for motoral combination, which is used as a reliever. And then when we get to step four and step five, we talk about Mark therapy, which is using it both as a maintenance and reliever therapy. The alternate track is the steps that we see below. And this is for patients who are already on a controller inhaled corticosteroids and are controlled. So they prefer not to change. And these steps are, they have their short acting beta agonist separately, but to this, they do take inhaled corticosteroids whenever the short acting beta agonist is used. So for step one, which would be those patients who are having very infrequent attacks, who prior would only have had a short acting beta agonist, we now say, okay, take your short acting beta agonist, but afterwards, having had an acute exacerbation, you take your SABO, but afterwards you also take a dose of an inhaled corticosteroid. And why is track one the preferred? Because low dose ICS for motorol reduces the risk of severe exacerbation and we have better compliance when we have the two in one, right? So when a patient at any of the treatment step has an asthma symptom, they use this combination as a single inhaler for symptom relief. And this is interesting because those of us who do manage patients on a, um, patients with asthma on a regular basis have been using ICS for motorol, both as symptom, both as reliever medication and as maintenance medication in some patients who may have said, listen, I don't tolerate using the salbutamol by itself. From steps three to five, if the person is on track one, they take this ICS for motorol both as controller and both as their reliever therapy. Now, it should not be used if a patient is already on a different ICS lava combination. So you're not going to give a patient this ICS for motorol to be used as their maintenance and reliever if the patient is already on a different ICS lava therapy that is controlling their symptoms, okay? So 
we recognize that it can be used because formoterol is a rapid onset larva, takes effects within one to three minutes and its effects are long lasting, lasts approximately 12 hours, right? And if it is just like the Savo, help should be short if they're sought, if there's no relief or if the maximum number of daily doses is reached. And we get, as I mentioned, compliance is improved and we are not just addressing the bronchos bronchospastic component of asthma, but we are also addressing the underlying inflammation. And this is just to underscore that in trying to prevent these exacerbations, we're trying to prevent severe adverse outcomes. You do have patients that will take a oral corticosteroids and you have patients who will say, Doc, can I have some just for backup? But it is shown that even occasional courses of oral corticosteroids are associated with an increased risk of side effects and adverse outcomes, including cataracts and osteoporosis. So track two, when should this be used? So track two is used if track one is not possible or not preferred. How do we use it? The patient will use a short acting beta agonist and then the low dose inhaled corticosteroid for symptom relief. And the patient will be taking an inhaled corticosteroid controlling medication regularly and using a SABA alone for symptom relief. So in other words, this patient is still on an inhaled corticosteroid at every step. When should track two not be used? Right, we need to consider whether or not a patient is likely to be compliant or adherent to their prescribed ICS controller therapy. Because many times they will say, "But doc, I use this one. It, I don't feel any way. I don't. It does not give me any relief." So they're using the short-acting beta agonist. In this group of persons, it is strongly recommended that you try to get them on track one rather than on stay on track two. What about the children? Children six to 11 years, again, for the steps going up, they don't have different tracks. They, it has been recommended that they to use low dose inhaled corticosteroid for every single step. And for those children who may be having mild symptoms, when they take their short acting beta agonist, they are also to take a low dose inhaled corticosteroid thereafter if they've had an exacerbation. So where children are having symptoms less than twice a month, they take an inhaled corticosteroid whenever they use their short acting beta agonist. And at steps two to four, what is recommended are increasing doses of the daily inhaled corticosteroids with the option of changing to the inhaled corticosteroid for multiple combination in these children. Referral to a specialist is recommended at step four for children and as well as for adults and adolescents. Now children five years and younger, and I often say the shorter patient is the more I feel intimidated because I rarely see children. I do if I have to. But looking at the children, it is recommended that children less than five years, if they are having what seems to be frequent exacerbations or frequent periods of bronchospasm, that they too are assessed by a physician accustomed to seeing asthma in children that the low dose inhaled corticosteroid definitely be on board from step two right up to step four. But for step one, where this person, this child has infrequent viral wheezing, then maybe a short acting beta agonist may be appropriate for the child who's five years old and younger. What about the llamas? So now we have been using teotropium as well. I think it was 2019 that teotropium 
either 2019 or 2017, that tier, tier tropium was included on the GINA guidelines. So we have been using tier tropium and some of us have even been using it prior to GINA included in, including it in its recommendations. So these long acting muscarinic antagonists, GINA has now said that, listen, for those persons who are persistently uncontrolled despite using moderate to high doses of ICS lava, please use an add-on long-acting muscarinic antagonist. And actually combinations of an ICS lava and llama are available in some countries. And this is recommended for persons who may be at step four or step five, rather than using a separate inhaler of a separate llama inhaler. Of course, if you don't have an uh, ICS lava llama combination available, use a separate llama inhaler for these patients who have persistently uncontrolled asthma. Adding a llama has been shown to modestly improve lung function, but oftentimes patients may say that their symptoms, especially initially, don't seem to, to, to respond. But what we do know is that with improvement of lung function, we are reducing the risk of having an exacerbation requiring oral corticosteroids or hospitalization. And with, with looking at the patient, modification of other risk factors, non-pharmacological treatment and adherence to therapy, oftentimes we will achieve control and the patient should feel better. Azithromycin. Azithromycin has been an antibiotic that has been making rounds. It has come out once where it's used in COPD um, and then it was thrown out. And then it has been used in looking at patients with COVID-19, whether or not azithromycin may improve outcomes in patients with COVID-19 infection. But Gina has now said, listen, let us look back at this azithromycin. And it is recommended for persons who have persistently uncontrolled asthma that add on azithromycin may be of benefit in these persons. And therefore consideration should be given to using it three days per week. This is not being used for any antibiotic effect, but there are thoughts to be improvement in terms of, the, the, of having an anti-inflammatory component as well as improving ciliary action. Ideally, this consideration or this recommendation should be done after referral to a specialist service or to a physician that is used to seeing patients with uncontrolled asthma because we want to truly determine is this asthma uncontrolled or are there other factors affecting the patient that precludes the asthma from being controlled that if we address these factors, we'd have a better outcome. We don't just add azithromycin for every patient. We have to look for atypical mycobacterium because of the risk of long QT um, TC syndrome, you should do an ECG and you have to look at your specific population and the risk of increasing antimicrobial resistance before putting patients with uncontrolled asthma on azithromycin. So that is it in terms of the looking at how we manage our patients. The real message here is that all patients should be on an inhaled corticosteroid. The preferred use is a combination of an ICS for motoral combination, which improves compliance, reduces risk of having severe exacerbations and adverse outcomes. And from step three to five may be used not just as reliever therapy, but as also maintenance therapy. In children, below age of six, it is recommended that they have an inhaled corticosteroid at least from step two, and that six to 12 age group should have an inhaled corticosteroid on for all steps. 
So what has Gina had to say about asthma and COVID-19? And I will dare say that this is an area that has become a little dear to me. And so I've taken the privilege of just expanding a little on a little bit more than what Gina has stated in its guidelines. So let us look at asthma and COVID-19. And a lot of this has come up because when COVID-19 first began, it was feared that the persons, and rightly so, that the persons who have underlying respiratory illnesses would be at an increased risk of having severe COVID-19 infection and the sequelae and uh, um, untoward outcome. So what has Gina said about asthma in this COVID-19 pandemic? So we do know that COVID-19 is caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, is the pathogen responsible for the COVID-19 disease, and no doubt throughout the world, we've had this increasing morbidity and mortality at what is a hashtag word nowadays, unprecedented scale. Right now, many Caribbean countries, including here in Jamaica, we're going to our third wave, and it is just horrific. First identified in Wuhan, capital of Hubei, China in 2019, it was declared a pandemic March 11, and just to say that us here in Jamaica, we recorded our first case on March 10, and at the hospital at which I work, since March 10, we've not been able to empty our isolation ward of patients who have um, COVID-19 infection requiring hospitalization. So as I said, they zeroed in when, when you know, this, this, this virus um, is most common entrance is through the airway, through the lungs. And so they were trying to find what conditions would preclude persons to having a severe outcome. And of course, they zeroed in on lung conditions based on the whole pathophysiology of the virus, including asthma. But as the pandemic has progressed, research suggests that this association between asthma and COVID is actually a bit more complicated and that not all persons with asthma actually are the same and that we may have to look at persons with asthma as having allergic and non-allergic asthma as separate risk factors. And what we do know is that especially in the earlier days, but as the variants come out, it may change that COVID-19 patients with asthma, particularly asthma that is controlled, were no more likely than patients without asthma to be hospitalized. Here in Jamaica, our greatest risk factors are comorbidities that contribute to having worse outcomes with COVID-19 infection would have included hypertension, diabetes, um, obesity and underlying cancer. So there, one of the, the landmark studies that was done was a retrospective study looking at over 490 persons in the UK um, and found that non-allergic asthma compared to allergic asthma heightened the likelihood of severe COVID-19. And one possible explanation that they were looking at was the ACE2 receptors, which we find um, throughout organs, but throughout different organs, but particularly in the lungs. And these ACE2 receptors are one of the gateways, the major gateways for the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. So there are multiple, multiple pathways. The ACE receptor is here shown on the human cell, and we have the virus that will um, attach to the to the receptor and as I said serve as a gateway for the virus to enter its cells and call and we it harbor. But on looking at persons with asthma even more closely, it was found that ACE2 expression may actually be in lower in persons who have allergies or allergic asthma compared to those that have non-allergic asthma. And indeed, persons who have non-allergic asthma may actually have an increased expression of ACE2 receptors. Further complicating this issue of COVID-19 and asthma is 
how severe is a person's asthma, is it controlled, is it not controlled, and whether they're taking medications and what type of medications to maintain control. So, so far, and this is important because when steroids were, were we were just underscoring the, the importance of using inhaled corticosteroids. And when COVID-19 started, the big question is, should patients stop taking their inhaled corticosteroids? Is this going to cause a dampening of their immune system that they need to be robust to ward off or fight the infection if they're exposed to the SARS-CoV virus? Steroids are commonly used to treat persons with asthma. Now we're saying everybody should be on it. And it is also possible that these steroids may actually decrease the expression of the ACE2 receptors, therefore potentially guarding the respiratory system. So the message here is, not, is that no, do not stop inhaled corticosteroids. And as I said, patients should be on their inhaled corticosteroids. And studies have shown that the corticosteroid usage did not significantly increase or decrease the risk of hospitalization among persons with asthma and COVID-19. We use the inhaled corticosteroids because we are trying to achieve control and reduce exacerbations and maintaining optimal asthma control will inevitably reduce the risk of severe outcomes in COVID-19. And it may actually help to suppress viral replication in the epithelial cells from people with asthma. So use or inhale corticosteroids. So, so far, it would seem that in patients with well-controlled asthma, in general, there is no increased risk of having a more complicated course. However, in patients in whom the asthma is poorly controlled, that scenario changes. Under no circumstances should we be looking at discontinuing therapy during now for patients who are controlled as a well-controlled asthma is the best provision of having a mild course if someone with asthma is, is infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. We need to educate our patients. Patients with asthma should pay close attention to any changes in their symptoms, especially to sudden increase in breathlessness and to a newly occurring cough and fever. Because the symptoms of COVID-19 may mimic um, an exacerbation and vice versa, patients need to be educated, caregivers need to be educated what they should be looking out for. So the best way to prevent an exacerbation is consistent proper use of medications and during this time, it is recommended that generally speaking, persons do not step down any control of medication unless it is clearly favorable from an individual standpoint. So that is why it is important to have this relationship with our patients and parents and caregivers. We continue to emphasize avoiding asthma triggers and other infection control mechanisms such as frequent hand washing, physical distancing, and of course, review of the inhaler technique. So a big issue that had come up, and especially for emergencies, emergency rooms, was the use of nebulizers. Because many hospital rooms, many doctor's offices, when there's a patient having an acute exacerbation and they do turn up for medical attention, would have used nebulizers to manage these patients. So what has Gina said about the use of nebulizers? A number of guidelines recommend against the use of nebulizers, including Gina, because there's an increased risk of transmitting, you have increased aerosolization. So there is an increased risk of transmitting infection to other patients and healthcare workers. And the aerosolized particles have the potential to carry bacteria and viruses and may be propelled over longer distance than that involved in natural dispersion patterns. 
Therefore, the use of nebulizers is not recommended as it may increase the risk of infection transmission. So what do we do? And this is what we started very early on at the hospital at which I work, which is National Chest Hospital. Our patients, even those in the emergency rooms, have been given a space up. And there's substantial evidence to say that nebulizers are not superior to the use of the MDI with valve folding spacers if these spacers are used properly. So the recommendation is to use a spacer unless unavoidable. If you have to use a nebulizer, use it either in a negative pressure environment or in an environment that reduces the risk to patients and the healthcare workers with the healthcare worker, preferably in um, PPEs and maybe in an open air situation that reduces the risk. The patient should be isolated or in a single room with the door closed. Long function tests and COVID-19. So we often use long function tests to, to diagnose asthma. So what is Gina now saying about the long function test? That is spirometry and peak flow testing. As I said, we use it to recommend or to confirm, to recommend, is recommended to confirm and monitor asthma. Gina now says that long function testing should be avoided during the COVID-19 pandemic as spirometry, when you have these patients blowing, blowing with much effort and much force, can disseminate viral particles and expose staff. We need to, to perform good history taking and physical examination to aid in our diagnosis and use clinical judgment to initiate treatment, which is very interesting because countries that don't have spirometry readily available. And I, I have gone to meetings where persons have been arguing on the use of spirometry to diagnose asthma as the gold standard because it is a... Uh, um, it may not be readily available and sometimes can prove to be a little difficult in interpreting the results. So right now, Gina is saying, listen, hold off, hold off, go back to basics, take a good history, physical examination, and use your clinical judgment to initiate treatment. As it, but these are guidelines, right? So what about masks? I've had patients with asthma say, doc, I can't wear a mask, I have asthma. Gina is saying that most persons with asthma can indeed wear a non-medical mask safely, and they are recommended to do so. The gaps between the mask fibers and around the edges of the mask have been shown to allow sufficient airflow. And wearing a mask can also block asthma triggers such as other viruses, pollen, um, cold air, and, and animal dander. Having worn a mask, it is not a substitute for other infection control measures, such as physical distancing and frequent hand washing. Vaccines. You have, you have so much information and I dare say misinformation going on about vaccines that Gina said, whoa, listen guys, let us look at vaccines and asthma and are persons at increased risk whether or not they do opt to take vaccines. So are the vaccines safe and effective for persons with asthma? So both the Moderna, the Pfizer, and the Johnson & Johnson vaccines, people with mild to severe asthma were included in these clinical trials. The Moderna vaccine clinical trial, which had more than 27,000 persons, 22% had underlying conditions. And the safety and efficacy for participants with mild to severe asthma were on par with results for the vaccine group as a whole. Therefore stating that COVID-19 vaccines did not affect or worsen asthma outcomes. So therefore, persons with asthma can receive the COVID-19 vaccine if they so desire. 
persons with asthma who use inhaled corticosteroids can get the COVID-19 vaccines. And there's no evidence to suggest that taking low or moderate doses of inhaled corticosteroids actually weaken the immune system and impact the effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccines. Even persons who are taking oral corticosteroids can get the COVID-19 vaccine. Yes, we recognize that we need much more research as it pertains to these vaccines and the effectiveness in these group of persons, but also it may depend on what's the person's daily dose and how long as it pertains to oral corticosteroids has a person been on this on, on, on this course of therapy. As it pertains to biologic therapy, which we use for persons who have severe asthma, someone who is getting biologic therapy still can receive the COVID-19 vaccine, but the two should not be given on the same day. And there should be at least a one up to seven days waiting period between injections minimum. After the COVID-19 vaccine, persons again continue to wear their mask. And as we are approaching the influenza season, persons with asthma should still receive their influenza vaccine. But it is recommended that a gap of 14 days be given between COVID-19 vaccination and the influenza vaccine. Challenges, and we know here in Jamaica, we're seeing them is for the persons who have chronic conditions, including asthma, it is the availability and accessibility of medication with the various lockdowns, curfew hours, etc. We need to ensure that our patients have sufficient medication, whether it be reliever or controller, and that we while they should have sufficient medication, there's no need to really be hoarding medication. Continuation of care is also important. And with the pandemic, we have moved into more, you know, telemedicine, phone calls, rather than having persons come in, especially in institutions, for example, that may have had to, to adjust their focus in managing patients. But these patients should not be ignored because you don't want someone who has controlled asthma now having uncontrolled because of lack of medical attention and around the risk of having an adverse event or worse yet COVID-19 infection with um, severe disease. So in summary, the GINA 2021 really emphasizes the use of inhaled corticosteroids from age six is up for everybody, all steps, and the preferred track for persons age 12 and above is the ICS for Motorola, or if they are unable to, to, to use track one, the ICS Saba combination. During this COVID-19 pandemic, all patients are encouraged to use their inhaled corticosteroids and their prescribed medication. They should be advised to ensure that they have a sufficient supply, nebulizers, spirometry, and other forms of lung function testing should be avoided where possible. And most persons with asthma reassure them that yes, they can receive the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you. Dr. Baker, amazing. Thank you very, very much. And especially as you tied in, you know, the, the pertinent aspects of asthma care as it, as it relates to what we're all facing, the, the, this COVID-19 COVID pandemic. Just a question or a comment. I recall the, um, a paper coming out of the, a group in the UK that um, seem to indicate that use of inhaled corticosteroids in mild or outpatients may help to prevent worsening of the, the the symptoms. And I and I in in looking at that, they seem to have gotten a clue to to its possible role 
from the fact that many of the asthma patients were not um, were not experiencing you know severe disease. The inhaled corticosteroid, I believe that was used in that in that particular study was budesonide. Um, here, you know, there's a lot of, we, we, we use budesonide, but a lot of persons are also using fluticasone. Do you think there's any intrinsic difference in efficacy between the inhaled corticosteroids or you think they're interchangeable? Thank you, Dr. Thomas. That's an excellent question. Gina actually says for track two and, and any inhaled corticosteroid, it should be at the appropriate dose. Right. Mm -hmm. So I have had patients who may be on betrametasone, but at 50 micrograms twice per day, that is oftentimes not a, su a sufficient dose for many persons who are on inhaled corticosteroid. So truly it, it matters very, very little which inhaled corticosteroid. It is any inhaled corticosteroid once it is that we have achieved control for that person. And I mean, years gone by, we would have a patient taking five puffs of betrametasone two or three times per day. Mm -hmm. In today's world, when we have so many options available to us, and when we recognize that it is difficult, this coordination of using the, um, the steroid, and yes, we, we say for everybody use an inhaler, as well as looking at compliance, we need not put patients under this five puffs of beclometasone um, at 50 micrograms twice per day. Having said so, beclometasone is still a good inhaled corticosteroid. We just need to ensure that we're using it at the appropriate dose. So you do have formulations that have 200 micrograms of beclometasone within the inhaler. That may be a better option. So to, to go back to what you asked, any inhaled corticosteroid, once it is achieving control in the patient and the patient is able to be compliant and adherent and we reduce the risk of non-compliance because of frequency of dosage. So, but I, I, I assume presumably one needs to ensure that there's good technique being used and or use of a, um, a valve spacer as well. If you're using, you know, the, the traditional meter dose inhalers. Um, go ahead, I'm sorry, you were gonna say something now? I, as I about to agree with you, and it's not, while we have guidelines as uh, the, the, the continuous cycle that we saw where we personalize treatment, we really have to look at our patients and determine what is the better option for this patient that is in front of us. Because you rightly say, we have MDIs, but you also have powder dose inhalers that have um, corticosteroids. So would this patient be better off? But it's not a one script fits all. So it's just personalized care. Okay. Um, and again, you know, it was really enlightening to many of us, I think. And I think I saw over 70 persons logged in on this, on this, um, uh, on this, this meeting. So I think your talk has been you know, hopefully really been impactful. Certainly, I, you know, learned the traditional way of starting off with the, the short-acting beta agonist and then moving on to adding in inhaled corticosteroid. So now it seems as if virtually, at least from Gina's perspective, everyone must be on an inhaled corticosteroid, either as a combination, um, in, a, in a combination format um, with uh, with uh, long acting beta agonists like formaterol or this separate track um, track two where if you use the short acting beta agonist you must use your um, inhaled corticosteroids as well if I'm understanding you correctly. Perfect. That is exactly it. And for the persons who are in step one on track two who have a separate short acting beta agonist inhaler, they may not be using it often because they're not having frequent exacerbations. But after they take a dose of their short acting beta agonist, they should take a dose of an inhaled corticosteroid. So therefore, perhaps um, from a, 
at least prescribing standpoint, maybe there should be a red flag every time, you know, one of our pharmacists see a script with, with um, this Ventolin or Salbutamol only, rather than, um, you know, also having an inhaled corticosteroid, um, you know, on the, on the script as well, uh, and perhaps notify the prescribing physician. Um, on another note, in terms of your combined, the combined combination with, um, well, what we have here, Symbicort, which is the budesonide and formoterol, um, many persons will use the 160 slash 4.5 strength, um, strength um, I think it's called a turbuhaler. How often can that be used if you're using it as a reliever? You know, initially you might start one puff twice a day, two puffs twice a day. If someone is experiencing an exacerbation, you use the puff, you're not getting adequate relief. How, how many more times can you use that or how often? That is an excellent question. And, and you know, guide, Gina is just a guideline and to look at the guideline. And when I was going through, I said, it said, okay, they say use according to the manufacturer's recommendation. And I'm like, okay, let me double check. The manufacturer's recommendation still has Symbicort, which is what we have most commonly, using it as a maintenance therapy. But there have been studies, and one study was a SMART study, which actually looked at multi-dosing. So as I said, some of us have been multi-dosing with Symbicort long before um, Gina came out. And one recommendation is that if you're using it as a reliever, you're using it as a reliever, you should not, the person should not need to take more than six doses of the ICS for multiple combination at any one time as a reliever. And I dare say, any person requiring so many doses of uh, reliever medication, whether it be the ICS for multiple combination or whether it be the SABA ICS combination should be prepared to be seeking medical attention at, you know, at an appropriate facility. So the recommendation is as a reliever, it can be used as often, but should not be used more than six times. But guidelines are guidelines. You have to know your patient, whether or not you're going to advise this person, listen, if you have used it four or five times and not getting relief or worsening symptoms, don't sit there and say, well, the guidelines, I can't use it up to six times. No. So it's just a roadmap. And then we personalize our patient care. You would typically uh, redose after what interval? Two minutes, five minutes, fifteen minutes. What would you What would you recommend? So I tell patients. So I may have a patient who is having more frequent symptoms. So I will say, okay, as even as maintenance, the recommendation is two puffs, and this is of the one sixty four point five formulation. Two puffs twice per day for maintenance. I've had patients that I have on two inhalations three times per day for a while, and then we step them down. And this is what we talk about empowering our patients. In terms of using it as a reliever, they can take two puffs, right? And wait about 10 minutes and then take another two. But if during that time, if during that time their symptoms are worsening, then then the suggestion is please find a medical facility. Understood. Great. So just to remind everyone, you know, please post your questions in the chat. Um, you know, Doc, the, the ex we have the expert here, and I know it was a very clear presentation, but I suspect there may be, you know, a few un, a few unanswered questions. Um, I believe as well, we should be, be um, introducing, at least have the option of, of, of prescribing a llama, that's a teotropium locally with, um, you know, specially authorized or specially authorized drugs requests being submitted to the medical benefits scheme. How much benefit have you seen in its use, um, you know, in persons that, that are uncontrolled? in addition to the baseline long-acting beta agonist, high-dose um, inhaled corticosteroid, et cetera? 
So I have been using Alama or Teotropium in particular because I don't have, have the, the, the ICS lava llama combinations available to me here, but I have been using a separate llama combination, Teotropium, for some years in patients who are persistently uncontrolled. But before we even add a llama to these persons, it, it, it takes a, a bit of picking through to find out, is this truly uncontrolled asthma? What is a person um, being exposed to? What are the various triggers? We've had to have, in some occasions, um, family meetings or referral to a psychologist for some persons. So it, it does take a bit of going through. Um, you have to ensure the person is using the inhaler properly. You have to ensure that um, that certain triggers are removed. I mean, I, I, I think I, I would have mentioned when I was there a couple of years ago of a patient that had birds. She had birds and she was not prepared to get rid of her birds. And yet she had se severe asthma. One day her mother accidentally left the bird cage open and the birds flew away. And I said, I, I empathize with her, but I said, thank you, Jesus, <laughs> right? Because this woman was having frequent attacks. And you know, you said, well, you can't replace birds, you, know, you can't just replace birds and encourage her to donate her cage. So one, you have to ensure, is this really uncontrolled asthma? In terms of control for those persons who are really adherent and we've looked at their triggers and tried to modify other lifestyles, such as esophageal reflux disease, it's pretty common in our patients with asthma, et cetera, then I have found that really using the llama makes a difference in terms of eventual control. Many patients may not, and this is where we have to advise our patients because they'll stop using it. Because I said, Doc, I use this thing and it makes no difference because some of them and most of the llamas are not inexpensive. Some of them use it and expect to get that relief as would come from a Saba or the ICS for multiple combination. So this is where education comes in. We're using this to reduce the risk of having an exacerbation. If in terms of symptoms, you're not just going to have this, this um, opening up of the airway and symptom relief, but it, it does work. Okay. So we have two questions. Um, first question, well, you can address them in the, individually. You spoke about the use of the chamber or spacer as an alternative to the nebulizer. What is your recommendation for the use of the chamber or spacer generally in the adult population, even in the setting of, you know, in the absence of, of an asthma exacerbation? So thank you, Dr. Thomas. This is this is a like near a pet peeve for me. Because patients will come, Doc, I have asthma so long, I, I, I don't need a space up, right? And therefore, that is why, one, as healthcare workers, we need to know what the proper mecha, um, technique is and go through this technique with our patients, not just on one visit, but repeatedly, right? It may not be every visit, but certainly repeatedly. It may be the second visit if, you, if, if they don't just learned the proper technique. And there have been studies that have been shown that sometimes up to 80% of persons do not know how to take a space up properly. So I advise my adult patients, and I see primarily adults, get a space up. And yes, the recommendation says a valve space up, but I also believe that no patient should be, should, should be made to feel less, any less or inferior if they have difficulty affording. So we also advise them how to make a space up because something is better than nothing at all. Now, when a patient has an exacerbation, and this is, this is a space to be used, whether or not they're having acute symptoms or for their control of. Fine, if their technique is not bad, you, 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 know, you compliment them, but you still encourage them because oftentimes, when there is an exacerbation, many persons become anxious. Their technique, if it was a little dubious before or poor before, becomes even worse during a, a, um, an exacerbation. And as we have said, 
Gina now says, listen, nebulizers should not be used. So we have been encouraging persons to get the spacer, have the spacer there, use a spacer for controller, and definitely have the spacer available in the event of an exacerbation. And this is the adult population I'm speaking of, because no doubt the children, caregivers and parents are recommended, listen, use the spacer for kids, but also we recommend it for adults. Okay, excellent, that was, pretty, that was very clear. The second question was regarding diet. So apart from medications, the, the, the question is asked, how, what role does diet play in controlling asthma? So I never went into a lot of detail or any detail. I just mentioned like the comorbidities um, and other, other factors that may impact asthma. And that is why I said personalized care is important. It's not just a script in terms of here, take this. So you have to look at the patient and you have to determine are, what are the triggers that may be, may be influencing um, the severity or the, the the level of control that a person has. Indeed, if you can identify foods that seemingly trigger the person's um, symptoms, it may not be a severe exacerbation, but I've had a nurse who had come to me once and I said, doc, I can get some, a prescription for prednisone. I said, why do you need prednisone? Oh, I'm allergic to shellfish and I'm going out to have some shrimp tonight. I'm like, what? She has asthma, right? I so you want me to assist in, in your demise, but so it is important to find out, are there allergies? And allergies may not just be due to food, but food additives as well. So if a person can identify the trigger, the recommendation is to avoid the trigger as much as is possible. Outside of that, you do have comorbidities that may be impacted by diet such as in a person who has gastroesophageal reflux disease, we recommend staying away from caffeine, which is not just coffee, but many teas having caffeine as well as sodas, things like cheese, um, alcohol, um, chocolate. And then I remember, you know, I was having, I'm getting very personal, a big player and decided, let me seek attention. And the uh, gastroenterologist says, Terry, you need to stay away from curry. I'm like, what? I said, I'm West Indian. I'm Caribbean. I'm Jamaican. You're going to tell me to stay away from curry? But yes, if you're having a flare up of gastroesophageal disease, stay away from spicy foods. As much as we are Caribbean and West Indian, stay away from spicy foods, including the curry. Yeah, advise them about sleeping positions, etc. Now, there is a feeling that you have certain foods that may be more allergenic or inflammatory in its, in its origin. And persons will speak about the nightshade vegetables. Um, Dr. Cordner in her rheumatology practice, you know, probably advises her patients more often than these, these fruits and vegetables such as eggplant, um, tomatoes, that the recommendation is to stay away from them. Dairy is another such thing. In truth, what the guidelines so far, and this is not just Gina have said, is that unless the person has a clear cut allergy or some other reasons precluding them from using these vegetables that are foods that they can certainly go ahead. But guidelines are guidelines. So you need to look at your patient. So I have a patient who is, she's supposed to be seeing a, a rheumatologist very closely, but she's just a hyperinflammatory symptoms and syndromes, including asthma. She has other stuff going on, fibromyalgia, PCOS, all sorts of things. So that type of patient, definitely I'm going to say, listen, these foods are known to, to be more um, allergic containing or, or contribute to more inflammation. My recommendation is to stay away from them. So that is it. That's how I approach my patients. Identify any clear cut allergies, whether it be to food or additives, and then you look at the patient, if they're having frequent exacerbations, then you may want to reduce allergic or immune enhancing foods and vegetables, as well as if they have any other comorbidities that diet will affect, then certainly avoid it. And obesity is another big issue, 
right? Obesity. Um, so you need we need to advise our patients in terms of exercise as well as diet to reduce obesity and and its effect on asthma. All right. So very very practical advice there. Dr. Cordner actually wanted you to comment on the role of peak flow meters, particularly, I guess, at this time of the COVID pandemic. From a very personal experience, I don't have, uh, let me know, I, I rarely have a patient now come into my office and do a peak flow reading. It would, again, it's individualized. So if I have a patient who for most times is, is controlled and they're coming in for review, et cetera, okay, I don't necessarily need to do a peak flow on this person. I need to educate them how to do a proper peak flow reading and to keep a peak flow diary. So when you're coming back, let me see your diary. Let me see what has been happening to you, whether it is on a face-to-face -face clinic or office visit or a, a telecom. So we're empowering our patients, do your peak flows, do it at home, keep a diary. Generally speaking, we're not encouraging peak flows because again, for, of, of aerosolization of particles, but patients need to be individualized. So if you have a patient that you think you need to have a peak flow done, make sure you have on a mask, you have on PPEs, and the person can do their peak flow, peak flow readings without hopefully exposing other persons around to, to aerosolized particles. Understood. Okay, another question. Have you seen evidence in practice to suggest that COVID-19 in itself is a risk factor for, I guess, development of asthma, especially persons who were previously non-asthmatic? I have not seen this um, really. Um, I just thought of looking back. I have seen, hmm, I've seen a patient who, when I, she had COVID, unfortunately, she actually had COVID twice. So, you know, this is a healthcare professional because it, it would take a healthcare professional to have COVID twice and require to be out because we just do things to the extreme. So having said so, this is a healthcare professional who had COVID twice. And then she was having and we can spend a long time speaking about long COVID syndromes, et cetera. But she was having symptoms really suggestive of bronchospasm. But when you got into our history, and that is why despite how high tech we become, basics we cannot ignore. When I went back into her history, she has a strong family history of asthma, and she used to have childhood symptoms suggestive of asthma. So is it that exposure to this virus may have unmasked, unmasked what was there before, probably. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen, but as it pertains to my practice and the patients I've been seeing, I can't really say I've been seeing anybody who um, the, the infection has caused asthma. We do know that persons may have asthma and one trigger is a viral infection. One trigger is a viral infection. So these persons may, I've had patients come to me, yes, doc, I do know when I get a cough or a cold, I wheeze, but I just know it's a cold causing it. And uh, I'm like, okay, hello, when you get over this cough and cold, we need to assess you whether or not you have asthma or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it is potential, but I don't think it is like that the virus is causing asthma. It may be that the person had undiagnosed asthma before, may have very mild asthma and only have infrequent symptoms, and having had this viral infection, um, the symptoms have now revealed themselves. Okay, so I'm not seeing any additional questions at this time. So yes, but the feedback has all been, you know, excellent. Um, many thanks going out, going out to you for an excellent, excellent presentation, super instructive. And I want to echo those same sentiments, Dr. Baker, it's really, really been a pleasure. So um, thank you once again, hopefully we can, um, you know, engage you again in the future to perhaps enlighten us some more. And please, you know, continue to stay, to stay well, stay safe as best you can.
Thank you, Dr. Thomas. It was certainly my pleasure being here. Um, on this Zoom platform, we understand it is what it is. I do love Antigua, so I do hope that at some point in time, you know, that we can look, have face-to-face -face interaction because although this is wonderful and it opens up the platform for more people to attend, I mean, it would be nice to, to have had been there with you guys. But thank you all. And thanks for sharing your meeting with me this morning. And thanks for inviting me. I too enjoyed being with you. Thank you. Okay. Stay well. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone for joining in.